it was interesting. I was listening to um, a, a scholar teach. He's one of the, the really renowned scholars. <clears throat> he does a lot of the, the the footnotes for for the NIV and for all of the Bibles and the study Bibles. Um, and he was saying, you know, we forget that the Bible was written to be heard orally, to, to be heard, not really to be read initially, because most people either couldn't read or didn't have it. Um, and so, so, so then he was saying, he, he always in, tells his students, he said, before you do anything, go and listen to the Bible. There, there's something about, yes, we can read it, but he says, we miss things in reading it that, 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 that are picked up orally, like as it's spoken to. And I must admit, Romans did that for me. I, what changed my heart for Romans was, I, I've got um, the audio Bible on the thing. And, and the nice thing, about, especially with Romans, is that, you know, we've put in the chapters and the spaces. That wasn't always there. And sometimes we've put them in at... <laughs> it's like it's like you're halfway through a conversation and you're like what and then because with the way we read it we come in and half and it doesn't make sense because we haven't read the before or the after and Romans I must admit I, I changed my view on Romans by listening to Romans straight through um, so if you can do that and, and, and there are ones on YouTube if you if you google it there's the audio Bibles these days I mean the old days it was hard to find but you, you find them there and, and just take it and, and listen to it through um, because it, it really does it does help it does does add a dynamic to it that we, we don't always see okay so we we're going to carry on in, in Romans 8 because there's that, that chapter there just is so much in it but of course just to recap we had had no condemnation verses 1 to 4 no domination um, verses 5 to 13 which is not going to be dominated by our flesh or by the law but be filled by the Holy Spirit then there was no desperation which was verses 14 to 17 um, and then from verse 18 we're going to look at no intimidation um, is is the the next part that we're going to be we're going to look at um, believers are, are not to be intimidated because creation because creation is groaning for our maturity to come to pass so it's this thing of step out of that intimidation become who, who God's called you to be the, the world is waiting for it um, step into the fullness of it so let's have a look at verse 18 um, we, it, it, we have we did read it last week but I'm going to start there anyway and it says I'm convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is about to be unveiled within us and that, and again, we said that that unveiling that we're talking about there is the word, the same word that you use in Revelation as the unveiling of Jesus Christ. But it's it's that he's unveiled, that it, nothing can compare to the glory that he wants to unv unveil in us. And, it, and that's where it starts. You know, we, we always want to see it out there, but God says, no, no, it actually starts, has to start in here. This is where I need to be unveiled and my glory needs to, 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 to come. Um <clears throat> And so, so we have this, this, this picture, and, and again, it's very much, we understand it in the New Testament. So the New Covenant, and we understand the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. What's the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant? Anybody? Jesus came and he said, there's a New Covenant. What was the old one? But it was about the law. It was about things being kept and about changing so so we, we have the, the difference between the old and the new and then Jesus came and he says that you know I've been, there's now a new covenant in me and the way to look at it is that the, the new covenant is always inside out working from the inside out old covenant working from the outside in I'm trying to change all these things be better do better change and 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 and, and um, you know suppress this and behavioral modification and or change my works so that I can become better that's old covenant old covenant is changing this to change this new covenant is first change this and then the rest will change does that make sense it's, it's the easiest way to sum it up but that's why it is so important that it starts within because the new covenant it all starts in I'm in Christ and it's if in me um, and so whatever um, moves inside of you and what comes out of you is the new covenant reality that we are we are in, engaged in verse 19 the entire universe is standing on tiptoe I love that picture yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters and, and as we looked at a bit of this last week um, but the glory is upon us and within us, and it's God's plan is to unveil something um, in these last days in us. Um, and that is his salvation. I, can we go to um, 1 Peter? I think I put it in your, in your books, in the next page. 1 Peter, and I want us to look at, so, so there is this, God is, is, is 
there is this groaning for this this thing that is coming within the, in, in, for God's sons and daughters to be mature and, and to come into the fullness. And Peter addresses this. One Peter one three. I've given it to you in the the um, ESV and the and the NLT versions. <clears throat> but it talks about. Um, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again um, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And that last time, that time is kairos. It's a kairos moment. It's a, it's a, it's a season or a time. It's an age. So, so God's going in the last, in the, in this, the last, in, in the time, um, in this Kairos moment, at the end of the age. I need to. I'm going to do something in my sons and daughters, and what I'm going to do is is this for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. He's going to reveal the depth of salvation. Um, the NLT puts it the. Uh, the TPT puts it this way, through our faith, the mighty, the mighty power of God constantly guards us until our full salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. So there, there's this, this, this dynamic that we see in Paul and we see it played out in Peter as well, in, and we'll see it in Ephesians as well, that sometimes we think it's now and then. Those are, as Christians, and that's where I lived most of my life, it was a Christian thing of, we are Christians now and we live with a certain amount of whatever and one day we'll have everything in its fullness. But scripturally, there is something more than that. There is what we have, what God wants to bring and unveil and what is to come. So, so we, sometimes we live with, with putting, we were here and everything else is pushed to there. And God's going, hang on now. And Paul addresses it, he says, I, I, you are need to become. You need to become my sons and daughters, radiant ones. These radiant brides that you are maturing into, not for eternity, but for now. So, so there's this trance. Sometimes we think this is what we are, and we don't grow from this. But that's not biblically the picture. He's like, actually, there is a fullness of salvation that is yours. There is a maturity and living in the fullness of Christ that we are called into and living in the fullness of His grace, that we're all called into, into growing into, to live differently from here to here before we get there. Does that make sense? Because sometimes in Christianity, it's this thing of, this is who we are and this is who we're going to be. But that's not the picture again and again in Scripture. Again and again in Scripture, there is this thing of going, but there is more for now. So that you become this mature sons and daughters, that the shining ones that I want you to be. So the, the sanctification of it, yes, the, the, the sanctification. But sometimes sanctification means it, it, I, in the whole of all my church life, sanctification was just to do better, was to live better. Where where the the the, the picture here is living more. Not better, but in the more, in the more of God, in the fullness of what He's won for us, in in the maturity and the deep, deepening love and the deepening walking in the, in the in the deepening of His of His what He's given us in His power and grace and salvation. Does that make sense? So so we need to. I mean, and I'm I'm bringing it up in the beginning because you're going to see it right throughout these passages that 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 it's not just we're saved. He's like no no, but there's a fullness of salvation that's coming. That I want you to, to 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 learn to grow into. So let me just carry on reading. It says, um, "Through our faith, the mighty God, of, uh, uh, the, the the mighty power of God, constantly guides us until our full salvation is ready to be revealed in the last time. So in the last days, may uh, um, the thought of this cause you to jump for joy, even though lately you you've had to put up with grief of many trials. But these only reveal the the, the sterling core of your faith." which is far more valuable than gold that perishes, um, for even gold is refined by fire. Your authentic faith will result in even more praise, glory, and honor when Jesus the Anointed One is revealed. Again, that word revealed is the same as revelation. So it's this thing of going, I, guys, you, you need, yes, you're living and it's hard and, and, it, and it's hard going, which is what he said, and there's grief and whatever, but you actually need to get excited because what you have and what God's going to birth inside of you is, is greater than, going back to our verse that we just read in Romans, is greater than, and the grief or the troubles that we, we actually face. We have a greater reality that is ours than actually what, what the world throws at us on a day-to-day -day basis. Does that, does that make sense? <coughs> 
And then I'm going to read verse 13, if you carry on down. Um, I, again, I gave it to you in both versions. In, in, in the ESV, it says, Therefore, preparing your, your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That word revelation is the unveiling again, or the revealed Jesus Christ. So, it's this, it, it, so he says, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revealing of Jesus in the, in, in the end times as he is unveiled. Um, the TPT puts it so then prepare your hearts and minds for action stay alert and fix your hope firmly on the marvelous grace that is coming to you for when Jesus Christ is unveiled a greater measure of grace will be released to you understand that we don't need a greater measure of grace one day in, in eternity we need a greater measure now so, so it's talking about a now it's not talking about one day when um, and again, don't get me wrong, is it hard to navigate this, that, that this is how God sees us? Uh, going back to that verse, in, the, you know, the, the, the verse that we read in Romans, that, that actually the entire universe is, is, is standing on tiptoe, yearning to see the unveiling of God's glorious sons and daughters. It, it's, it's, it's a dynamic that we don't often hear, and we're not often called to, called up to. And that's why in verse 18 he says, I'm convinced that any suffering we endure is less than nothing compared to the magnitude of glory that is, is about to be unveiled within us. He's like, this is what God wants want to do. In the last days, there's going to be a greater depth of salvation, a greater grace, um, and a greater faith to live it out. Are we all okay? Um, so so it's, 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 a, it's a beautiful thing. The more you get... Um, this, this whole thing of, of creation growing. There's a new revelation of our salvation is coming to us. Um, and it's ready to be unveiled when we're ready to get it. And, and so sons and daughters being unveiled is what God is doing in these last days. And, and creation is groaning. That was the, 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 the I think I put it, um, did I put the Romans verse in there as well? Um, sorry, let me just go. Yeah, that I. Yeah, and likewise, this, we'll get to it in 26, but it, it talks about the Spirit Himself intercedes with the groanings, but I didn't actually put the first verse one. But so the world is groaning. We did it last week. Um, the, 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 the creation is groaning to see, yearning, standing on tiptoes is the way he and, and, and described it. But in, 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 in the, the last week, we looked at the, 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 the other way it's put is, you know, the earth, the creation is groaning for God's sons and daughters to rise up and be who He called them to be. So that's what we looked at last week. Um, so, so we have this, this this picture of creation is growing for us to get it. Um, and the more free we get and living in the fullness that God has for us, the more free creation in the universe gets. And again, concepts that I don't understand, but this is what Scripture is saying. So everything is waiting for us. We think we're waiting for God, but God says, hang on, I've given you everything. We did these verses last week and with the sermon. God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Every spiritual blessing has been given us. God's like, I have given you everything. We think we're waiting for him, but he says, no, no, I've given you everything um, that you need to know for your life and godliness. I've given you gifts and fruit and wisdom and the power of the Spirit. I'm waiting for you, my sons and daughters, to arise and to be unveiled for who you really are designed to be in my glory. Are we good? Okay, so let's carry on going. Um, uh, where am I? For against, uh, for against its will, the universe itself has had to endure the empty futility resulting from the consequences of human sin. But now, with eager expectation, all of creation longs for freedom for its from its slavery to, de to decay and to experience with us the wonderful freedom coming to God's children. To this day, we are aware of the universal agony and growing of, of creation, as if it were in the contractions of the labor of labor for childbirth. Um, so, so we have this 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 earth, this universe that is groaning, that is yearning for us to step into the fullness um, that God has for us. These 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 labor pains, and this is where, interestingly enough, often it is trans. When we look at earthquakes and we look at stuff in, in we, we, we're very quick at going to end times of going this is the end of the world and it's going to hell in a handbasket but actually biblically some of that is the labor pains of earth groaning for us to become who God calls us to be so in this context the, the groanings of the universe the groanings of creation are for sons and daughters 
for you and me to step into the full glory and become all that God is wanting us to be and to to, to, to usher in his freedom that then becomes the, their freedom as well. Um, so it's 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 this thing of of you know, obviously the whole picture of 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 labor pains is is something emerging something coming out of a cocoon um out of the shell and emerging into the glorified person that God has for us um and so so yeah it's it sometimes maybe what we're seeing this trembling um and this 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 the shaking is more of an anticipation and the labor pains um coming to pass than it is about doom and judgment and going, hey guys, the earth is desperate for us. Trembling, okay? it, groaning it, it, with, with an, anticipation for us to become. Um, and I, I don't, we, it's not always a calamity or a judgment. In fact, it may be the universe waiting um, for us to be unveiled in, in who God wants us to be. Any comments? Are we good? It, it's, a, it's a very different mindset, but the problem is when you get to these scriptures, I can't make it fit into, rev, into what we, we make Revelation fit into, because this is not what it's talking about. It's talking about this, this, this new full salvation, this, 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 this stepping into this, this glory that God has for us here. And, 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 and we read that verse a few weeks ago, that that glorification has already taken place. It is ours. The fullness of Christ is ours. God has given us everything we need for now. God is waiting for us to take hold of that and to step into the fullness that he's given us so that everything else in this world can become strangely dim. We good? Okay, 23. And it's not just creation. We have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit, also inwardly grown as we, passionate, as we passionately long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed. So it's not just creation. We have we are, we are already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit, also I, we, also in the re, inwardly grown. So there's a lot of groaning that's happening in this chapter. Number one, the, the creation is growing. Secondly, we are groaning. Big, big, big surprise there. Um, but this is, not, this is not groaning as in what we do normally. This is, this is the, 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 the des, it's, it's a desire. It's the groaning for more. It's the groaning to become all that God has for us. Um, and so... <laughs> yeah, groaning for the papers. Um, anybody talk to me about that word first fruits in that verse? It says, and it's not just creation, we who have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit. What are the first fruits of the Spirit? First fruits is obviously that which comes first. It's the first harvest normally. What, what is our first fruits in the Spirit? Yep. Yeah. What have we got? What is the first fruits of the Spirit? What have we received already? Yep, yeah, we've received the Holy Spirit. And because of that, we've received His gifts. We've received His fruit. Yep, yeah, we've received the, the, the fruit that comes with it. Um, what else? Wisdom. Yep, yeah, all the good. Um, his power. Remember the Holy Spirit? We've received His power. We've received, we've received His wisdom. Um, and so we, we, we receive His life, this effervescence. And so the, the, the fruit of the Spirit, that, that everything that is ours, that He's like, that we spoke about a few weeks ago when, when we spoke on, on um, when I did the Holy Spirit thing of all that He is. We've received he, His presence. We've received His power. We've received all of those things. Those are the first fruits that we've already received. Yeah, Are we all okay with that? We've, we've all understand. And He has given us access into the fullness that, of Jesus. And we get to, to receive that. Um, and the, therefore, the, that fullness of salvation. But now, interestingly enough, it's the first fruits. If you go to... Um, Ephesians. Let me, let me jump. I'm probably possibly jumping where I shouldn't be jumping, but let's go anyway. Um, Ephesians, it's on your paper. I did put it there. Ephesians, the bottom of the page, 1, 13. It says, In him you also, when you heard the word, of, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee. Now, that word guarantee is the same as, as seal, is the same as, as down payment. It's, it's also the word um, a down payment guarantee. What is the other one is translated as? Yes. But interestingly enough, in Greek, the word for that is engagement ring. <laughs> 
it's engagement ring. So that's why he's translated it. Um, we will see it now. So let's just read it. And he says, um, the gospel of your salvation and believe in him were sealed with the, prom the, promised of the, ho the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee, the down payment of our inheritance. Remember, the Holy Spirit is, is, is the one going, hey, You've got everything at, 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 at hand, um, of your hand, until we require, we acquire possession of it to the praise of, of his glory. Across the page, I'm going to read it to you in the Passion Translation. It says, And because of him, when, when you who are not Jews heard the revelation of truth, you believed the wonderful news of salvation. Now you have been stamped with the seal of the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has given, he has given to us like an engagement ring as the first installment of what's coming. He is the hope promise of a future inheritance that seals us until we have all of redemption's promises and experience complete freedom of all of the supreme glory and honor of God. So there's this, this picture, it's in Greek it's the word aroban, which is that word seal, down payment, installment, um, and, and in Greek it's, it's, it's the, the, the direct definition of it is engagement ring, hence why it's been a thing. But what it is saying Think about what it is saying. He's going, guys, everything you now have is just the first fruits. It's the first installment of all that you're going to get. I mean, well, to be fair, we even un haven't even fully unpacked and immersed ourselves in the first fruits, in what we do have. Have we fully immersed ourselves in the life and the spirit, in his power and in his wisdom and, and, and revelation and gifts? As well? Please, like it's, it's it, at best, we, 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 you know, we, we, we bump into it every now and again. And he's going, but actually, in the Holy Spirit, that, that, the Holy Spirit is our guarantee of that's just the first fruits. There, it's our engagement ring of the promise that there's so much more coming. Um, and so, so that's the picture that in Christ we have so much more. Um, that the wedding is going to, can you imagine what the wedding is going to be like when we have received Christ and His fullness, if that is already what is ours? Um, and so we, 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 we're tasting the, the, the earliest beginnings of the first fruit of the Spirit, which is just, I, when, you, I, when you sit and think about it, you go, God, I, I don't understand. You're so generous. You, you're so effervescent in what you give. There, there's so much. I, 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 I you know, it's that thing of going, well, I'm not going to give you any more till you use the last that I've given you. And, 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 and it, that's not who God is. He's like, no, my darling, I've, I've given you everything and I've got more in store. That's how much I love you. That's what I have for you. Um, so let's look, have a look. Uh, let's carry on going. Um, so that was verse 23. <coughs> uh, so it says that we have been given that the, 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 the first fruits. Um, sorry, let me just change my page. So there is an anointing that is coming um, that will unveil for our, uh, our full status of, as God's sons and daughters. And interestingly enough, in that passage, it includes our bodies. There, there, there's these throwaway lines in Scripture that I'm going, okay, God, can, can we just sit and talk about this? What are you saying here? Listen to, did you see that line at the end of that, that verse? It says, um, so we have, we have already experienced the first fruits of the Spirit, also in, um, inwardly grown as we passionately long to experience. So it's us groaning to passionately and long, long to experience our full status as God's sons and daughters, including our physical bodies being transformed. Hallelujah. Hey, it's, it's this thing of going, we, we live with this limited expectation. And it, 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 yes, in eternity, all of that's going to be gone. We, we're not going to live broken or, or sad or anything else. But there is an invitation into the more now. And, and that's, that's always the, 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 the interesting thing. Why do we pray for healing? Why do we stand and believe for me and for even? Because God says there's more. Do we do we always know how to walk in the fullness of that? No. Do we always know how to act? No. But but the reality is is uh, we groan like they talk about there. Our groaning is to to live in that more, to walk in that more. And God's going, and there is more. So so desire it, that, that, that expect it, and desire it like you 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 are doing it um, for the fullness of, of me. And so I I just love it. I I, I was reading about the the, is, uh, the Israelites as they were walking through the, the desert. And how many years were they in the desert? Do you know that the scripture says their clothes never wore out for the entirety of the, they were They were well and well fed and their clothes never wore out. Now, some of us may go, geez, that's boring. <laughs> the same clothes for 40, 40 years. But the reality is going, that wasn't in eternity. That was in the old covenant. And that's how good God was to them. He's like, I, I, I can move supernaturally in any way I choose. I, I'm not limited to, oh, God can't do it this side of eternity. 
Why not? We, in this group, we have seen God do amazing things time and time again. But sometimes I feel like God's going, can you get your hope up, please? It, it's like our hopes have so like diminished that there's no expectancy, there's no groaning and eager anticipation for the more of God. Am, am I making sense? Um, and I, I get that sometimes it's hard to live in that tension, but that's what we're called to live in. And he says, in that tension, shine for me. In, in, that, in that desire of, of wanting and living from the fullness that I give you and, and figuring out what that looks like, because goodness me, it's all ours. But sometimes we're like a baby with a computer, not going, I'm like, I don't know what to do with all that I've got. But that's okay. God's like, that inward growing, come, come learn. Come learn what the fullness of salvation is. Come learn, take hold of these first fruits and understand that it's just the beginning. I've got so much more to give you. There's just always this incredible invitation. And we want to go, if, but, but we don't see this. We don't know how this is going to work. We don't. And God's going, really? Like, like, forget about the negative. Hope. Hope in me. Live from that place of hope. Which goes, takes us to the very next verse. For this is the hope of our salvation. But hope means we must trust and wait for what is still unseen. For why would we need hope? For something we already have. There is this has to be this expectancy. If we're going to hope for God and get our, get our hope up, means that, that then I, I need to get my hope up and start praying that, you know what? That Mia will, that the, 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 the problem will be found, the solution will be found, things will turn around, and, and we see God break through. We see God break through in Gary, and that, that stomach is healed, closed, and done. No more seeping. We have to get our hopes up and believe for these things. We have to believe in a, in a country that it feels like it's corrupt or in a, in a, you know, around us. We have to believe for more. When our hopes are based on what we see in this world, we are not going to be the shining ones. We're going to be the very tarnished ones at the end of that deal. Do you know what I'm saying? Are we good? Any comments? Okay, so we've got creation groaning. We've got us groaning. Good groaning, not bad groaning um, in this. Um, but then we'll see there's, an, there's something else that groans. So let's carry on reading. And it says, um, okay, did we read verse 25? Because I heard this... Okay, so because our hope is set on what is yet to, yet to be seen, we patiently keep on waiting for its fulfillment. And, and can I just stop here? Waiting is something we... <laughs> it's one of the biggest things in, Christian, in Christianity is this, this, this tension of waiting. Tell me, what is God's wait... When God talks about us waiting, what, what does that mean? What does God's waiting look like? Sorry? Resting in, Resting in his arms, definitely. With an expectancy? With an expectancy? Yep. You were going to say a bit? No. The, the answer, okay. Um, with an expectancy. But there is also this thing of, and trust. With an expectancy has to be a trust. Have we ever had this thing where you, you know God's called you to something? You, you've heard God's promise. God has promised me this, or he's going to do this. But often we take his promise as his timing and we get ourselves into trouble. Do you hear what I'm saying? Often we go, well, if God has said it, then I need to see it now. But, but over and over again in scripture, his promise and his timing were two very different things. And in between that is his waiting. And, 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 and our job is, is to manage that waiting and again, I think we, we did it when we did talk about Isaiah, it, that, that wait upon the Lord. Um, and in those that wait upon the new, Lord will renew their strength. The, the word there is entwine themselves with God. Those that wait, entwine themselves with God. So it's how we wait. And what we've just read is that we need to be waiting with hope. We need to be going an expectancy of going, God, you're going to do this. You've given us this. We, we're groaning to, to navigate the more of this. Show us how to do this. And so waiting isn't passive. Yes, it's leaning back into him, but, but it's, it's, it's connecting to him and twining ourselves to him and going, okay, so what does it look like to walk in your spirit? What does it look like each day to, 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 to become more like you, to, to, have, to, to see things from your heart, to, to pray from your spirit, from your heart? Does, am, I, am I making sense? So, so there's, 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 there's this, this, this waiting and this expectancy that needs to come in. So it says, but her, um, so because our hope is set on what is yet to be seen, we patiently keep on waiting for its fulfillment. And that, so that waiting is not patiently sitting doing this. 
God, when is this happening? It's, if, if I see nothing happening, I need to know that God has put me here for a reason. And I think this is where we miss it sometimes. Because we sometimes think waiting is, is robbing us of something. And God's going, no, my darling, I could move you on tomorrow. If, if you're here now, the waiting isn't the problem your attitude of heart is. Because there's something here and now that I want you to bring me to, that I want you to live in the fullness of, that I want you to, to, to shine me into. Do you hear what I'm saying? So, so sometimes maybe it's our attitude to waiting that's keeping us waiting. Does that make sense? It's a hard one, but it's our attitude. Of, what's, what's that look for? Uh, you know, you can pray and pray and pray for something in absolute positivity, hope, um, but it never arrives, and eventually you start thinking, well, maybe it's not God's will. Mm. And so I just let that prayer slowly go. dissipate, mm. and it dies. Yeah. And, and, and we need to take it back to God. Like, honestly, he's a good dad. Ask him, do I let this go? Or is it something that I, and often God's like, well, did I tell you to let it go? No, okay. And sometimes he'll go, yep. The things that you're praying for are often, you know that it is God's will. And he wouldn't have let it go. No. It's hard. hard. It's hard going. And and God's going, but but again, it's going, your, your faith is in me, not in what you see, not in the time. Think about, I mean, we read the stories like the kiddie stories, but think about poor Sarah. Like God promised her a child. And, and the woman waited a very long time. And, and more than that, she, she, you know, she was old. <laughs> and if all the facts were not only, so it wasn't the waiting, not only was hard in the length of it, but it was going in the opposite direction, if I can say that. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't like there was more hope, there was hope coming. It wasn't. We said, you know, her womb was dried up like a prune. Like it was like, it it was becoming more and more of an impossibility. And so, and God's like, but, 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 but I, I gave you my promise. And my promises are yes and amen. And, and my promises, and this is where we get to, are always from an eternal perspective. And unfortunately, we often look at God's promises from a worldly perspective. No, that's all we know. <laughs> it, it is all we know. But uh, ironically, the minute we accepted Jesus, we, we became eternal beings. So he's like, awesome, come into my world, and now you get to live from my perspective. <laughs> we get to live from eternity. And so when I'm praying, I'm not just praying for here and now. I'm praying with God's eternal perspective. It looks very different from that perspective. Somebody, one of my very wise lecturers used to say, in your life with Christ, you can't sum it up in where you are today. Because all of us would go, uh, <laughs> how's your life and growth with Christ? Mm-hmm. They're not doing too well. It's been a hard week. It's been a hard whatever. And he said, you always, you don't manage it. You don't look at your growth in Christ and your life in Christ in the here and now, in the day to day. You look at it, look at it in a decade, in two decades. Because then you see God's movement and his hands and how he's grown and grown you and changed dynamics that seemed impossible and changed who you are. That's a better eternal view. It's limited for us, but it's a better view for us than today. Does that make sense? Because we can look at today and go, oh, how? Nothing's really changed from Monday to today. It's just got worse. <laughs> it's like, where's the hope? Where's the expectancy? And God's like, I'm, I'm working. I'm working. And there is hope. Have hope. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this. Wait, knowing, carrying the fullness of my glory. Carry it in us because I'm working. But look at it from eternal perspective not from the limited earthly, worldly perspective that we have. Look at it from, from who I am. That one lecture was of the Gideon, where he described how teeny tiny we are. It's like, mm, mm, you should be so small, Lord. Yeah. It, it is like a little bit that can cross that. Completely. I know, for instance, you like the grains of sand on yep. the beach. You go and look at the sand on the beach and think, my word. Exactly. Australia. So um, it is a difficult concept. It is a very so difficult concept. Did you actually have that Sure. But the goodness of God is that 
he again, he, his, his perspective on that is completely the opposite. Scripture says he, he loved you so much that he created all of that for you. He created universes that, you know, and, and, and Alex, galaxies and stuff that we are never going to see in our lifetime. But he created it for you nonetheless, because that's how extravagant he is. Like, so, so we all, do you understand? Our perspective is very much <laughs> sand. <laughs> like, where am I in, in the light of this, you know? Something under God's feet that got stuck under the, the tree. Do you know what I mean? And God's like, no, you don't understand. Like, I love you. The whole premise of scripture is that he loved you so much that he created the world. My, my Sunday school teachers always used to say, if you were the only person on earth, he would have still created the earth and still come to die for you. It, it's that that we forget. And so that's again coming back into who we are in Christ that we've looked at. And it, that's his grace, that's his glory, that that's how much he loves us in spite of everything else. And he's going, and that's, the, and, and because I, that's how much I love you, I have poured out my grace. I've poured out the richness of my spirit. I've given you my engagement ring of m- so much and more to come. Does that make sense? Huh? Yeah. The, the, the big, the, the, the revelation talks about when, when Christ comes and the fulfillment is, it's, it's the, 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 the groom comes back for his bride in the, in the great wedding. And that's why we are meant to becoming the mature bride and prepared bride because he is coming back and, and scripture says he will not come back for an immature bride he comes back for a mature bride um okay so verse 26 let's just go there um and in a similar way the holy spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty i just just that word line for a moment isn't it it's so comforting that the holy spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty he doesn't go can you pull your socks up please <laughs> can, can you get over yourself and then i will deal with you he doesn't i just uh, you know for me that gives me hope is that line of of um the holy spirit takes hold of us in our human frailty to empower us so he picks us up and he's like, I'm going to empower He empower you. And, and the, one of the ways that we need empowering, that's why it says, for example, he goes, for example, at times we don't even know what to pray or know the best things to ask for. Who's ever felt like that? Mm-hmm. Exactly. But the Holy Spirit rises up within us to super intercede on our behalf. I'm pleading to God with, emo- with emotional sighs too deep for words. So now we have the Holy Spirit groaning. He, the Bible says he intercedes with those deep sighs and groans on our behalf. So when I don't know what to pray, he prays for me. In my weakness, he's like, I've got you, babe. I've got you. Um, and that, that word there is, is such a cool word that he's translated it super intercede. But that, that word there is, I'm not even going, to, it's this, this long in Greek. I'm not even going to try and pronounce it because then you'll think I'm talking in tongues. But it's, it's that, honestly that long. But it's, it's, it's that, that word, the, the, the prefix is hyper, it's hooper. So, so it's, 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 his intercession is hyper intercession. That's the word that is used. That's the prefix in Greek. It's not just I'm going to intercede for you. Man, I'm going to hyper intercede for you. You've got the Holy Spirit hyper interceding for you. I just love that. Like, it's like, he's not just like, there, there, I'll say a prayer for you. That, that's not what he's saying. He's like, babe, I've got you. I'm going to, I'm going to go before the father. And I, because sometimes we don't even know what to pray, but he's like, when you don't know what to pray, I'm going to, with, with sighs and groans and with hyper intercession, bring all that you require. And even that which you don't know you require before God. That is so comforting to me that, that, that in my weakness, that's who, who's got my back. Um, and we all know that scripture, I think I put it in, in, in the thing that, that First Corinthians, when it talks about in my weakness, um, and I put it there. Yeah. I want to misquote it for you. Um, yes, the last one. On the bottom of the page, 2 Corinthians 12, it says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me sometimes we're going God I just when I am strong when I am strong it'll all be great and he's like my my darling but sometimes I want to actually use you in your weakness because your weakness declares of me because it couldn't be you couldn't be you had to be me 
So sometimes we're so scared of our weakness and we think, but how can God use me because, and we normally have a whole ring of things behind that as to like, I haven't, I'm not, I'm, you know, like we're a bit like, what is his name? Moses, who I stutter and I can't do this and I'm old and, and he going, hang on guys. I actually, my power is made perfect in weakness. Don't despise your weakness, but turn back to me. Find me in your weakness. And maybe that's our problem, is that God's not scared of our weakness. He's going, I'm going to use that weakness. And I'm going to bring my power through that weakness. And that's probably the, 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 the sort of the, the, the dichotomy we battle with, of God going, actually, my darling, you may look weak according to the world, but I'm going to give you supernatural spiritual strength, my power, my spirit, my giftings. And, and, and for us, in our worldly way of thinking, you have to be a strong, together, fully functional person to actually move in power. God's economy goes, no, my darling, you don't have to be any of that. In fact, Scripture says he chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to take you in your weakness. But if in your weakness, in your thinking, I'm just this, or I'm not good enough. He's like, in that place, if in that place you let me in, and you let my power work, and you accept that actually this me, weak me, is, is live, has been empowered by the Holy Spirit and in, am glorified by God to be the sons and daughters of God, then suddenly that changes my weakness. And it, it, my weakness does not become my excuse. And my weakness is not something that, uh, how can I say, steals my true reality from me. It is just something, it is just a means that I work through, whatever that weakness is. And we all have them. We all have weaknesses. And sometimes we feel that our weakness disqualifies us. Nowhere in Scripture does it say our weakness disqualifies us. Nowhere. How cool is that? In fact, he says, I'm not worried about your weakness. In your weakness, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in and move with power. So we need to be careful what's going on in our head. Because sometimes those lies rob us of, of what is actually ours. Um, so the Holy Spirit makes super duper um, hyper intercession for us 24 7. He's always before the throne. Um, and uh, it says there, um, <coughs> Romans 8 26, I've given it to you on your, on your list there. It says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for when we do not know what to pray, um, pray as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The next one underneath, 1 Corinthians 14 18, says, I thank God that I speak. In, um, no, no, that no, wasn't the one. Where was it? There was another one I was supposed to give you. Did I not give it to you? Um, uh, next one, Romans eight thirty four. Is it right? Okay, no, that's Jesus. Okay, I, I didn't. I, I didn't put the other one in. So we've got the Holy Spirit interceding for us, groaning for us in, in ways that only He can. But then in that, the next scripture we're across the, the, the road there, it says, who, who, Romans 8.34, Who is to condemn us? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. For who, for who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Um, in Romans 7.25, Consequently, he is able to, to save the uttermost. Though he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he is always lives to make intercession for them. So here, let me just paint this picture for you in case you think I'm weak and I can't do anything. All the time, all the time, you have the Holy Spirit in you making intercession for you. You've got Jesus in the throne room making intercession for you constantly. So Jesus in, in heaven in the throne room, Holy Spirit in us, both making constant intercession and the last third of the Godhead answering. Like we, we're covered girls. We, we, we're so scared we can't do this or we don't have enough. And God's like, everything about us are interceding for you. We know what you need. We know what's required. I am, we, we're there. We're praying for you. We're interceding for you. And the Father is, is, is wanting to answer because we are praying from his will. That's where we live. We, we couldn't be in a better place if we tried. Prayed for by two-thirds of the, the, the Godhead and answered by the third. Come on. That, that's, a, that's a good place to be in. Um, and that's that's where we get to live from, um, from from the fullness from the fullness of Him. That picture of, of intercession is the picture of of um, Joshua when he was fighting the battle and then he was losing and then they got they they, they took Moses and they held his arms up. Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Who held his arms up? Anybody? Good Sunday school question. Anybody remember who were the two guys that held? 
Aaron? Who was Aaron? The he was the high priest. Yep, but he healed up there. Who was the other guy? You remember? Her. H-U-R. Her. Her held up, um, up, up the arms of, of Moses. And interesting, her means, uh, means the spirit of light. So the picture in that thing is us fighting there and God holding us up by the, the Jesus the high priest and the spirit of light. That's, that's the picture. So when you think I'm fighting this alone, understand that the Holy Spirit and Jesus are interceding for you, holding you up in prayer, and you can fight and win the battle. You are never alone. You never have to do this alone. You never have to do this in your own strength. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And it's a really beautiful and powerful picture um, of, 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 of all that God does for us. Okay, let's go back to where we were. Sorry. Um, wait, wait, okay. So, 27. God, the searcher of the heart, knows fully our longings. Yet he also understands the desires um, of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones, in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. Do you hear what he's saying here? He's going, hey guys, God is, is you, you're groaning and you, you, you're going through hard times and, and God is searching you, not just for your longings, but also for the desires of the Spirit he ha that the Spirit has for you. Because sometimes, like, I don't know about you, but sometimes I don't know what to pray for me. I don't know where I'm at. And it just, it, again, it's encouraging for me that he says, the Holy Spirit, God is looking at you and he searches our heart knowing your longings for will, but also understanding that the Spirit knows better and, and hearing what he has to say for, on, on your behalf. Because the Holy Spirit passionately pleads before God for us, his holy ones, in perfect harmony with God's plan and our destiny. That's the beauty of it. The Holy Spirit knows those things. He knows what God's plan is for us. He knows what God's destiny is us, for us. And so often when we think that God is searching our hearts, we think he's looking for the junk. But this verse does, says the other way. It says God is searching your heart for those things that, that he's going to pull out that are, are, are he, and he's going to answer so that you can fulfill the destiny that he has for you. He, he's searching you going, hey, babe, I created for you and I'm going to call out those longings and, and those desires that the Holy Spirit is praying for and I'm going to equip you to fulfill the destiny that I have for you. Sometimes we still think God is the Grinch, that, that he's looking to, to trip us up. But God's like, I, I'm always wanting you to fulfill that, that which I've called you to. And I'm always going to be before that. So we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good. And we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his, design purpose, his designed purpose. We know this verse well. For God all works, works all things for the good of those who love him. But think about what it says here. For we are convinced that every detail of our lives is continually woven together for good. For we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his design. Who of you have ever done weaving? Weaving. Mm. Or tapestry would be the same thing. Um, carpets. You know the story about the backside. When all you see is the backside, it looks like nothing on earth. It's just odd threads and knots and it doesn't look like anything. And these odd colors and it doesn't work together. And you turn it around. And it's this beautiful <laughs> tapestry or carpet. That is exactly the, the language that is used here. We are con we are, uh, and so we are convinced that every detail of our life is continually woven together for good. God's going, listen, my darling, it's not always going to look like it's good. It's not always going to look like it's working. It's going to look like it's a knot. It's going to look like it's a random thread. It's going to look like nothing is coming together. But I'm telling you now that what I'm doing your, in your life is working all things for the good. I can see, again, eternal perspective, I can see the front of, this, of the tapestry. You can't, but I can. And I'm telling you, no matter, because sometimes it's that thing of, oh, we have regret because of this dark spot in our life, whatever that is. But then you turn and you think, I've wrecked it. Now there's this horrible black spot. But often when you're doing tapestry, suddenly it just takes one little dark ascent to make the whole thing come alive. And again, this is our picture. This is the problem with us and God. We, we often look at it from our perspective, from a worldly perspective of what's going on. And God's going, it's all working for good. And we get irritated with God. Doesn't look like it's working for good. It's hard and it's gnarly and it's doesn't even, the colors don't even work. <laughs> and God's going, my darling, will you trust me? I am weaving these things together in intricacy and beauty that one day you will see. 
in the fullness. But I can tell you right now, I see it. And it's beautiful. Trust me. Does that make sense? Because sometimes that word, word is like, God works all things for you good. And you go, really? How? I don't see how this, what we're going through now is, is for good. And that again is that eternal perspective. When we step back, we go, oh, now I see the purpose for that. I needed to grow there. I needed to, 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 to be challenged in that. I needed to let go of that or whatever that thing is. But it had a purpose and God is working it for good. Any questions? We good? And for we for we knew for he knew all about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him. Again, we've been saying this ad nauseum, but here we go again. What is our purpose? Is to become like Jesus in the world. What does he want to do? In us, he wants to unveil Jesus to the world. He wants to shine his glory and he give us his power and work all things for the good. Not so that I can look spanking, but so that I can look like Jesus and the world can see Jesus and go, oh, that's what I want. So, so we again, it, it sums up this thing beautifully. This is the whole point, is that he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his son. That we become just like him. And then to end off, having and de determined our destiny ahead of time, he called us to himself and transferred his perfect righteousness to everyone, uh, to everyone he called. And those, he possessed, he, and those who possessed his perfect righteousness, he co-glorified with his son. And that's what we read, that, that verse that he, he, just, he called, he justified, and he has glorified. He's like, my darling, my glory lives in you. My son lives in you. The spirit is at work in you. He has poured out his fullness. There is more to come. But my heart is that you would groan, that you would groan to know more of that and to live in more in the fullness of that daily so that you would look more like Jesus, that that tapestry, my end, would look like I have intended it to be and that the world would see that and want him. Yeah? Any questions before we close off? For me, this is always such a amazing thing because I don't have a good opinion of myself. Yeah. And. Uh, and am I really good enough for this? Yep. And, and unfortunately, that is the devil's biggest lie that he uses on us. <laughs> and, and, and the world's biggest lie, because it, it goes the minute in our head, it's okay, but we can't think otherwise because then it's pride, it's arrogance. Mm -hmm. And God's like, again, and we've said this before, biblically, arrogance is thinking something that God doesn't. So ironically, me thinking that I'm junk, biblically is arrogant. Because, because arrogance is, pride is, is me thinking something that God doesn't think. Does that make sense? So pride is thinking, oh, God, you know, not God's thoughts, my thoughts. But then what are your thoughts? If your thoughts is I'm a useless worm, then that's as prideful as I'm the king of the universe. Because it's not God's thoughts for you. D does that make sense? So, biblical humility is thinking of myself like God thinks of me. Which for us is difficult, because God thinks we're amazing. God thinks we're flawless. Not in an arrogant way, but in an accepting way of going, so therefore, I don't need to worry about me. And this is the problem. What does me thinking I'm a worm do? Is, is I do less, because I think I'm not good enough. I don't, I don't receive all that Jesus has given me. Because I, I'm not good enough to receive his gifts or his power or, 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 or I don't live like the fullness. So it robs me of the fullness of what God. So that's what, you know, thinking less of myself does. And, and, but when I get to think like God thinks of me, you're my daughter. You are who I called you to be. You, 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 you're, you know, beautiful and you're equipped and you're powerful. What it does is it stops me thinking about me because then I don't have to worry about me. God's taken care of me. Do you hear what I'm saying? I, I don't need to go, am I good enough? I'm like, I can get up and stand and do what he says. So when God says, okay, 
I want you to get up and I want you to go and pray for that person. I don't go, oh, but God, I'm just not good enough and I don't feel like I... That's not there. It's like, sure. It's not an arrogance thing. It removes the, 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 the segregation thing of us doing what God wants us to do. Do, do you understand the difference? I'm not saying you need to talk around, walk around going, look at me, I'm the bee's knees. No, everything about us points to him. But do you understand, me thinking I'm junk definitely doesn't point to him. But me going, I am a daughter of God who is truly loved, truly forgiven, and who God is, even in my weakness, he's gone, babe, I'm going to use your weakness, because that's what we've just read. Let me come in with my power and watch me blow the world away by your weakness. I was just thinking when you said, you said you don't have a very high opinion of yourself. Of course, I've got a completely different opinion of you. I think you are amazing. Yep. You are German. You are... Because <laughs> that makes you amazing. <laughs> You've got this high integrity. When you say you will do something, everybody will know you will be punctual. You, you, you yeah. have this high integrity. But maybe your personality is like that. I don't know you that well, but I would imagine that you are a bit of a perfectionist. Mm. Not? Mm. Not. Mm. Okay, then I'm wrong there. But, but what I'm trying to say is, now I'll talk about myself, mm. is, um, what, what are we talking about? <laughs> I, I was thinking less of ourselves. I was thinking less. Okay, so, um, sometimes with me, I have this high expectation, or I haven't arrived, say, in my Italian where I want to. Sure. So I had this um, uh, a coffee with, uh, oh, in, in, I don't want to waste your time. So anyway, um, I met this lady through Facebook, who's uh, fluent in Italian, she's actually Indian, um, and I met with her at Dario so I could practice my Italian. But she's highly, highly fluent. Uh, you're fluent. She lived in for six years in Siena and Italy, worked as a tour guide there. And she's got a doctorate degree in anthropology. So I think, oh wow, she's up there. Yeah. And, I, and I get things, and I know she's also into alternative meditation or, I don't know, meditation, maybe Indian stuff. And I get so nervous because I thought, I know it's not true, but then I kind of think, oh wow, she's a big, who, who am I now really mm. to, but it's all, it's all Monty. lies, exactly. because I am in Christ and God can, yep. can use me in any situation and that's why I pray, maybe something <coughs> more, what she's always on about the Italian, Italian. but um, I believe that God can use that passion that sure. I have in my life. Sure. For example, if I told you about my sister-in-law, and I'll just tell you it in, in one minute. So um, my sister-in-law, a bit older than me, and she was looking for a way to um, keep her mind going so that she doesn't get um, uh, dementia or something one day. Um, and she was so inspired by me learning Italian that she decided to also um, learn Italian because apparently learning a new language is a very good way to keep your mind active. Um, so it's just, so I've never had a close relationship with her. Since she's decided that, she, we're now speaking over the phone. It's just a way of showing how God can use something Everything. like completely, can, Completely. And then I think, I, I understand what you were saying earlier on because I, I've been praying now for, uh, for also long for people in my family and I think how long will it take yeah. for things to change and I'm praying for my brother in Italy who said he's not a believer um, and, and, and I'm thinking but this is urgent, he, something mm. must happen, he's already 70, 75 and, and I think it's a what wisdom can I have? What can I say to to change, to bring mm. a change in in loved ones' lives? But 
God can, uses the weak to confound yep. the wise. He uses Gideon who said he's the weakest of the tribe. Yep. He, he can... So our faith... It's like sometimes when I stand on the beach and I look at the, at the ocean and the mountains and I think, we must actually become aggressive against our yep. enemy in the spiritual world and say, no! I'm not going to have this doubt. I'm talking to myself, yeah. having but a monologue what? with myself. Because all that power, mm. the, the oceans, the mountains, all God's power, God said that the power that raised Christ, that from, the raised dead. Christ from the dead is exceedingly abundantly able to do more. Yep. And so, no, in spite of, of everything around me that I don't understand, I believe that all that power mm -hmm. can work in me. And, bring about change. and that's why in the New Testament, our greatest challenge that Scripture is taking us back is the is is the battle of the mind. It's being transformed by the mind of Christ, and we say these words nicely, but it literally means that when I feel like and I feel, wake up and I feel like a toe, going no, actually, even if I do feel like a toe, God can still use me. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step out and not worry about me feeling like a toe. Look to Him, accept all that He's done for me, and live from that place. And he goes, guess what? Then I can do in your weakness. I can do so much more. And that's the place we need to get to. It's the place of going, okay, God, here I am. I'm not going to listen to these lies anymore. It's, life's too short. What are we doing? Why, why, why do we let that dictate um, so much of our life? And God's going, my darling, you've done Romans. I've done everything for you. I have given you everything. And there's an expectation for more. And you're not even using what you've got. But come, come, I want to do it through you. And I'm going to do it all so that you look more like my son. And that the world gets to see him. So Father, thank you for just your incredible love for us. Your incredible power that is work within us. That you take us even in our weakness and you make us and you work your power through this through us and we you, you use it for your glory thank you holy spirit and jesus that you are groaning um, for us in intercession and praying even when we don't know what to pray you're praying that we we covered in prayer we covered in, in in your faith for us and, and and lord that we would look from those perspectives and get our hopes up and go you know what god thank you thank you for who we are thank you for who you are thank you for all that you've given us and i pray again that you would help us take hold of that which you've already given us thank you for your glory that is in our lives thank you for your holy spirit and for your empowering and for the fullness of christ and help us to walk it out take hold of it and live from it in jesus name amen